In this video, you're going to learn about one of the most important and most common research methods used in the sciences. This is called the controlled experiment, which is used to try to find cause and effect. Scientists have many different methods they can use to discover the principles that make up our world, our universe. They can observe, they can do case studies, they can do correlations, they can do surveys. But when they're trying to find out if one variable has an influence on another variable, what we call causation, cause and effect, then they do what is called a controlled experiment. We're gonna see how that works in this video. In the social and behavioral sciences, like psychology, we often do controlled experiments using human beings. If you're going to do an experiment on human beings, you need to go to an institutional review board, we call it the IRB, to get permission. So the IRB is a group of people who will look at your experimental design and see whether or not anyone is being harmed. If anyone's being harmed by your research, then you're not allowed to do it. Here is the fundamental idea of a controlled experiment. We're going to compare two groups. They're called a control group and an experimental group. These groups are treated exactly the same except for one factor that's called the independent variable. The control group we do nothing to, but the experimental group gets this treatment called the independent variable. And then later, we're gonna measure the two groups on something else that we call the dependent variable. To do a controlled experiment, you first get permission from an IRB if you're working with human subjects. Then you randomly select a sample from the group you're interested in, we call the population. Then you randomly divide your sample into groups, at least two groups. You treat the groups exactly the same except for one thing we call the independent variable. So one group, the experimental group, gets this treatment. The other group does not. The other group gets a fake treatment called a placebo, and that group is called the control group. Then in the end, you measure them on some other variable we call the dependent variable. And if the two groups are different on the dependent variable, because they were treated exactly the same in every way, except the independent variable, then we assume that the independent variable must have caused the difference. Here's an example. Suppose we're wondering if caffeine has an influence on memory. Okay. We randomly select a group of subjects. We randomly divide them into two groups. One group gets caffeine. That's called the experimental group. The other group gets a fake caffeine. That's called the control group. And then later we measure their memory like we measure the number of words they can remember or recall. Now the caffeine is called the independent variable. And the number of words recalled is called the dependent variable. Here's another example. Suppose we're interested in whether student test scores would be affected by distracting sounds. We randomly select a group of people. We randomly divide them into two groups. The experimental group will get what we call the independent variable, in this case, distracting sounds. The control group does not. We later compare their test scores to see if they're different. So in a controlled experiment, we always have a control group that we use as a comparison group to compare to the experimental group that gets the independent variable. Here's a joke about it, the control group versus the out of control group. <laughs> in a controlled experiment, it's important that the subjects don't know if they're receiving the treatment or not because their knowledge might influence the results of the experiment. That is called a single blind experiment. It's also important that the researcher that's working, any researchers working with the subject should not know which group they're in. Their knowledge might also influence the outcome of the experiment. So we, that's called a double blind experiment when the subjects don't know and the researchers working with the subjects don't know which group the subjects are in. We want all controlled experiments to be double blind experiments. Here's a cartoon about double blind experiment. Ha ha, the researchers are blindfolded. Yeah, that's not what we mean by a double blind study. 
in a controlled experiment, the experimental group will receive the treatment, whatever it is, we call that the independent variable. The control group that we're gonna compare them to has to receive a fake treatment called a placebo. And we make this comparison because of something called the placebo effect. It turns out that sometimes when people are told that a certain treatment will influence them in a certain way, or if they just believe this, that it can actually have an effect. That's called the placebo effect. So if I have 100 people with headaches and I give them a fake treatment, maybe a sugar pill, and say, this is a powerful painkiller just developed in Japan, some of those people's headaches will go away. Yes, their headache actually goes away because they believe that the pill is going to cure them and maybe they relax or they calm down and this makes their headache go away. So this is called the placebo effect. So in a controlled experiment, we always compare the experimental group with the control group who got the placebo. And we wanna show that the treatment the experimental group gets is better, is significantly better than the placebo effect. So I give 100 people a sugar pill, 100 people with headaches take a sugar pill, I give them and tell them it's a powerful medicine from Japan, and maybe 30 of them, their headache goes away. So if I have a, another treatment that can beat 30, then I know that that treatment is really having an effect. Besides the placebo effect, we have to watch out for the experimenter effect. The person who's working with the subjects could potentially give away the treatment. So the person working with the subjects must not know which group they're in. This is what we mean by double blind. A really famous example, many years ago, there was a horse in Germany called Clever Hans. And it turns out Clever Hans could do arithmetic. You ask Clever Hans how much is five times two, and he would clomp out 10. A clever psychologist observed and noticed that if the person asking the arithmetic question did not know the answer, then Clever Hans could not solve the problem because the person asking the question was unconsciously, unwittingly giving body cues to tell Clever Hans when to start clomping his foot and when to stop clomping his foot. So for example, his owner would say, how much is five times two? Then he would look in the face of Clever Hans and that was a signal to Clever Hans to start clomping his foot. And when he got to 10, the owner would look down to see if he's gonna stop. And that was a signal to Clever Hans to stop. This is called the experimenter effect. It means the experimenter can unwittingly, unconsciously give away something to the subjects. So in controlled experiments, we all, always must be double blind. The subjects don't know which group they're in and the experimenter doesn't know who's getting the treatment and who's getting the placebo. Okay, here's a quick summary of the controlled experiment. You start with an experimental group and a control group. The experimental group gets whatever we call the independent variable. That's the thing that the experimenters are manipulating. It's going to be the cause of something. Uh, the control group gets a fake treatment called a placebo. Then we make sure that it's double blind. That is the subjects don't know which group they're in. The experiment is working with the subjects don't know which group they're in. At the end, we measure the, what is called the dependent variable. That's gonna be the effect, the thing we're trying to find out if it's influenced by the independent variable. And then we compare our results. And here's something new. We're going to calculate a number called the p-value. So next we learn what the p-value is. Here's a problem we have at the end of an experiment. If we get a difference in the scores of the control group and experimental group on the dependent variable. We don't know what caused their different scores. It might've been the independent variable. Yes, that's what we're trying to show in the experiment, but it might've been luck because we randomly divided the subjects into two groups. So you might've had differences in the two groups. So we need to calculate a number called the p-value. Every experiment has a p-value. It tells us the probability that these results might've happened just by luck. And that p-value will be like a percentage, like between zero and one. So we want it to be small. We want the probability that it's luck to be small because we want to prove that the independent variable has an effect 
on the dependent variable. We don't want it to just be luck that the two groups are different from one another. So we want the p-value to be small. And if it's smaller than 0 0.05, we call the results statistically significant. They're significant in their statistics. That is, we, we think we can trust that the independent variable did have an effect. At the end of the controlled experiment, if the two groups are different in scores, we don't know why they're different. It might be because of the independent variable, but it might have just been bad luck. So we calculate a what's called a p-value. This is a number between 0 and 1 that tells us the probability that these results would happen just by luck, just by chance. So we have ways to calculate that. And every scientist knows how to do this. Just use your computer. You calculate the p-value. And if that p-value is smaller than 0.05, it's less than a 5% chance that this was luck, then we say, okay, the results are statistically significant and we accept that the independent variable probably did have an effect on the dependent variable. But if its p-value is larger than 0.05, we say, whoops, we, we can't accept these results and they might be true, but we have to do more research to find out if it's true. Here's a cartoon in the science laboratory. There's a sign that says, thank you for not doing research that's already been done. But no, this is wrong. We always want to do research that's already been done because this is called replication, because we want to make sure that the, that the results are accurate, that it could have been luck. I mean, if your p-value is 0 0.05, that means about 5% of the time, you're going to accept results that are false. So we need replication. Here's a cartoon about the research center that's doing research on mood disorders, and they have a sign on their door, out of sorts. Okay, funny. Okay, a couple cartoons about research. On the left, the scientist says the two groups can't agree. They're, they're mice. On the best route to the cheese, so Dr. Lazarus will introduce another variable to break the impasse. Yeah, he's going to introduce the cat. And then on the right, the little boy's doing show and tell at elementary school. And now a little science experiment I worked on over the summer is going to show uh, Frankenstein monsters. No, we don't want our research to end with a Frankenstein monster. And one last cartoon that will get you thinking. Here are the scientists in the laboratory and one says, sometimes I wonder if there's more to life than unlocking the mysteries of the universe. Oh, that's pretty funny. Well, that brings us to the end of this video on controlled experiments. I'm Professor Bruce Heinrichs, and thank you for watching. Please check out my other videos. I have lots of videos on psychology on my channel, Brucey. Bye.